Hello, everyone. Welcome to our webinar, Making a Murderer, False Confessions, Wrongful Convictions. Thank you for joining us. I'm Mary Kate DeLuco, Communications Consultant here at Death Penalty Focus, and I'm here with my colleague, Yoko Otani Sperlin, who is the Business and Finance Director. She will be running the show for us. Thank God. <laughs> and we will be recording this video and it will be available on our YouTube channel in a couple of days. You'll get an email when we have it up and running and it will, um, with a link to the uh, YouTube channel. And we will also link you to a resource page because we cite statistics in this um, webinar today. And we'd like to credit the organizations where we um, obtained these statistics. And we also, because we have, um, Dr. Uh, Richard Leo with us, who has an extensive bibliography and has written so much about this. We have a list of his books and articles that will also be of interest to you and that will also provide additional information. Finally, we will have a q and A. I do have to warn you, we don't always get to those questions. And again, I'm hoping that our resource page will answer any questions that you might have, but we will try to get to them if time permitting. And now I'd like to introduce you to our Death Penalty Focus Board President, Mike Farrell. Mike. Thank you very much, Mary Kate. Um, I, I'm thrilled actually to be here today um, with Richard Leo, an old friend who's uh, a quite extraordinary uh, expert in the world of police interrogation practices. Um, psychological coercion, false confessions, the wrongful conviction. You know, there's so, so many questions about how it is that somebody would be put in a position of uh, uh, confessing to a crime he or she didn't do. Uh, and Richard has made a, an extraordinary study of the science of this. And it's for that reason that he has been invited and he's graciously accepted our invitation to... Uh, to be with us today and help people understand uh, the uh, the breadth and the depth of this phenomenon in the world of criminal justice or criminal injustice in so many cases. Richard, it's wonderful to have you with us. Thank you. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here. Thanks very much. We're going to um, we're going to talk about a number of things, um, and I want to uh, want to ask you. First of all, according to the National Registry of Exoneration, since 1989, at least 3,431 exonerations have been recorded by the registry, 434 of these because of false confessions. That's 13%. But when you specifically focus on homicide, the percentage goes up to 23%. What does your research show about false confessions and why are they more prominent in homicide cases as opposed to other criminal cases? Well, first, thank you for that wonderful introduction, and and uh, it's great to be here. Um, so we see this pattern replicated in other data sets as well, that when you look at um, exonerations, whether they're DNA exonerations or non-DNA exonerations, a higher percentage of the false confessions will be in the homicide cases compared to other crimes. And the, there's other research on this, and not just my own research. Um, and it, you know, you have a dead body in a homicide case, so you don't have access to kind of evidence you might have when, when, when you in the non-homicide cases, eyewitness evidence, for example. But the homicide cases are, of course, the most serious cases. And the system invests the most serious resources or the, you know, police who um, get unlimited overtime or task force or multiple homicide detectives, sometimes in high profile cases, dozens and dozens of homicide investigators willing to do six, eight, 10, 12, 14 hour interrogations. And so there's more intensity, more pressure to solve the crime right away and more emphasis on the interrogation than on other forms of evidence. And so that's why we believe that number jumps. And of course, in capital cases, you know, the incentives are so perverse that there's even greater pressure or potentially capital cases, greater pressure to solve the crimes. And so even more resources, so more intense 
um, more intense interrogations. Uh, Sam Gross, a retired professor at the University of Michigan who co-founded the National Registry of Exonerations, wrote a great article in the late 1990s about how errors and wrongful convictions were systemically more likely in capital cases. And it followed this theme from investigation to um, prosecution and post-conviction. Mm-hmm. Um, you've said, uh, well, first of all, you offered, I believe, to present for us a, uh, a, a fairly brief uh, PowerPoint that might, uh, might help people get a grounding in the understanding of this science. Can you present that for us? I will, and I will try to be brief. Um, and uh, this may also bear on the question that you just asked. Let me pull this up. Okay, I hope everyone can see. Um, so uh, I just want to go through a few things about interrogation and the way I think about false confessions based on the research. And this PowerPoint, I assume, will be posted. So if I go through um, any of the slides a little quickly, you, you'll have access to them. Uh, so so Amer- American police are trained in what's called the Reed method uh, of interrogation, which is the dominant method and has been the dominant method going back to the 1940s. It's really synonymous with American police interrogation. Everybody is really trained, or almost everybody, in one form or another of the Reed method of interrogation in America. I mean, investigators, detectives, uh, and most interrogation methods that don't call themselves the Reed method uh, really are. It, it reminds me sometimes of what they say about literature. Everything is a variation on Shakespeare. In this realm, everything is a variation on the Reed method. So, The Reed method is designed to teach investigators essentially to be human lie detectors. And once they uh, decide that the person is guilty, they launch into a guilt presumptive interrogation. And it's based on certain assumptions, some of which I have listed here, that trained in their method, they can tell whether somebody is lying or telling the truth, innocent or guilty based on their body language. I've got some slides on that, Um, that people will not confess unless they are pressured and persuaded that the Reed method and and mainstream interrogation methods do not and will not lead to false confessions, um, that these methods are not psychologically coercive. So needless to say, I disagree with a lot of these assumptions, uh, but it is interesting. They believe that um, good interrogators are not born, they are made, and that is the purpose of the training. And this manual that you see is hundreds of pages and they put on three-day, four-day, advanced two-day seminars. So, uh uh-oh, my um, PowerPoint is not advancing. See if I can get it to the next one. Okay. So the methods of interrogation themselves are, for me, the kind of simplest way to summarize it is guilt presumptive. In other words, they presume the guilt of the suspect, the goal is to get a confession. Accusatory, it's not going to be question and answer. They accuse the person. The person's going to deny. They challenge those denials to get the confession and essentially trying to confirm their pre-existing beliefs. And these are some of the techniques, isolating suspects, building rapport, accusing them, challenging denials, confronting them with evidence, which can be false evidence, made up evidence, talk about that a little bit more later and minimizing their culpability uh, and essentially trying to pressure the suspect and persuade them to think it's in their best interest to stop denying and start confessing. Now, um, Mike had mentioned the National Registry of Exonerations, which is a great source of data for exonerations. Uh, And Uh, There's essentially two sources of data in this field. One is real world data, like the data the National Registry of Exonerations posts, but also individual case studies published in aggregated case studies, the separate DNA exonerations that were, and I believe still are, maintained by the Innocence Project in New York, and then other social science methods like laboratory recreations, 
which um, have limitations in terms of their realism, but also have the benefits of um, laboratory manipulation and laboratory controls that you can't do with real world data. So if you wonder where does our knowledge of these subjects come from, it's from essentially these kinds of data. There's other data, survey data, interview data, but basically it breaks down into these two categories. And um, when somebody asks me, why would somebody falsely confess? Why would it, an innocent person falsely confess? I, I want to um, make the telescope bigger, because it, it, so to speak, because everybody is thinking about that moment, like the last 15 seconds. And I want to expand it and answer the question a little bit more systemically. And so I've identified, and others have as well, kind of a, a tripartite framework of three sequential police errors that lead to false confessions and, and, and often wrongful convictions. So the first is, is misclassification. Now, remember that I said um, interrogation is guilt presumptive. Police are trained, don't interrogate unless you are convinced the person is guilty. They say reasonably convinced. So the process is designed for the guilty, not for the innocent. No interrogator would want or should want an innocent person in the interrogation room, it wouldn't be consistent with their training. And so when an innocent person is put in an interrogation room and subjected to an interrogation, there's a misclassification error by the police. And it's not surprising because they're taught how to read body language, for example. They completely misquote the science in their manuals. The science basically says most of us get it wrong you know, 54 to 60 percent of the time and 60 is chair, right 54 to 60 percent of the time. So, you know, little better than the flip of a coin. And when people come in with a guilt presumptive bias, they're going to have more confidence in their erroneous judgments. So one one area of study, one issue is why does the innocent person even get into the interrogation room? And apart from any interrogation methods, imagine the thought experiment you have department one, and out of a thousand people they interrogate, 999 are guilty, or guilty is not the right word, but but have knowledge or participated in the offense, right? And so that's department number one. Department number two, 500. 500 are totally innocent, 500 have guilty knowledge or participation in the alleged or uh, accused offense, right? Obviously, you could have horrible methods in department number one, and you're just going to get one false confession. Whereas in department number two, you could get hundreds. So um, I, I hate to sound like an academic, but proper suspect selection investigation procedures are hugely important in understanding why false confessions happen, even though they predate the actual interrogation or precede the actual interrogation. Um, okay, so then the next error we call the coercion error. So an innocent person has been mistakenly classified by the police investigators as guilty in their mind. They subject them to an interrogation. Not everybody confesses. Most people think they would never falsely confess. How is it that police sometimes elicit false confessions? In the interest of time, I will simply say that um, interrogation is a two-step process. All the interrogation techniques fit under these psychological two steps, convincing the suspect he or she is caught, all the evidence is against them, denial is futile, that's really the stick, and then the carrot is suggesting what we sometimes call motivators, inducements, um, incentives or benefits, reasons why, rationalizations why essentially the, the, the police trying to persuade the suspect it's in their best interest to stop denying and start admitting. They might suggest moral reasons, psychological reasons, or legal reasons. Those reasons might minimize the blameworthiness. You did this accidentally. It was in self-defense. I would have done the same thing. Everybody would understand, but if you continue to deny, people will think you were premeditated murderer, maybe you're a serial murderer, you plan this out, you're a monster, you need to be put away for life, or worse. Um, you know, and then and then similar kinds of sorry, somebody called good scenario, bad scenario, minimization, maximization is the academic language. Maybe it's a uh, 
intellectual form of good cop, bad cop, but give them a good choice and a bad choice. And if they take the good choice, they still incriminate themselves. Um, and in understanding which techniques lead to false confessions disproportionately, we, we have techniques that we identify as risk factors. And what that means is in the experimental literature and the field literature, these techniques are more likely when applied in an interrogation to an innocent person to lead to false confessions than to true confessions. Over and over in the false confession cases, we see very lengthy interrogation. This goes back to Mike's point about uh, why in homicides more people falsely confess. As I was saying earlier, the, the, the length of time is much greater, as is the intensity of the interrogation. False evidence ploys is an academic term for lying to suspects, telling them you have video surveillance when you don't, or their alleged co-perpetrator gave them up, um, or you have their fingerprints or DNA or some kind of evidence that doesn't exist lying to them. Minimization, I mentioned, is downplaying the significance or implying that they'll be treated more favorably, may even get leniency if they confess, that sometimes shades into full-blown promises and threats. Um, and then we also talk about, in this coercion error, the vulnerability of some individuals. Um, uh, and there are three groups that tend to be more highly suggestible or compliant. Um, juveniles, adolescents, uh, people with intellectual disabilities, and... Um, people with certain forms of mental illness. Most of the documented false confessions are not from people with in these groups. It's just people in these groups are disproportionately vulnerable to and likely to make false confessions. So even though everyone's skeptical that an innocent person would falsely confess, that they would falsely confess, most of the documented false confessions are of mentally normal people, adults. And then finally, what we call the contamination error, where police feed details to the suspect, um, pressure the suspect to adopt a narrative consistent with the police investigator's pre-existing theory of the crime. The, the suspect, when they're broken, repeats that back or guesses and fills in details. And those contaminated facts are then used, how we've all heard, well, they had to be guilty because they knew details only the true perpetrator would know. This was, I think, a bigger problem when police interrogations were not recorded. Now that they're recorded, if they're fully recorded, which is the most important reform has been for the last three decades in this area, you can see whether there is contamination or coercion. The problem with contamination is it makes wholly false confessions appear to third parties, to lay people and other criminal justice professional, professionals, makes, it appear, makes the confession appear to be true. Because not only would the lay person or potential juror or the media uh, uh, journalist doing the investigation or the appellate court, they're all saying the same thing. It's a detailed confession not only do, did the person know details that nobody else knew that weren't likely guessed by chance, um, but they also tell a coherent narrative. But of course, the police know those details too. All right, so this is my last slide. I hope I haven't um, spent too long on this part of, the, uh, of our uh, afternoon together. This is simply a slide showing that when people are told there's a confession, it introduces a bias which increases the likelihood of conviction, right? So police um, will think that the confession is the gold standard. And so they'll stop the investigation. They've got their guy. Sometimes they won't even look for obvious corroboration and they will ignore or rationalize away um, exculpatory and contradictory evidence. Um, prosecutors, uh, we've shown charge higher, um, ask for higher bail. Uh, make the confession the centerpiece of their case. Uh, defense attorneys, many defense attorneys um, assume their client is guilty and will tell their client they'll get convicted. Um, and uh, so there's more pressure even from them often to plead. We know that juries are more likely to convict. We know that judges will sentence higher when there's a failure to show remorse. And of course, in post-conviction, a, a confession is often considered a gold standard and uh, it will be harder to reverse a case 
if there was a confession. So I hope that's a little bit of an overview of the questions, the big questions. Mm -hmm. How does police interrogation work? What's the psychology? Counterintuitively, how can it lead to a false confession? And how can these false confessions, or why do they sometimes lead to the wrongful conviction of factually innocent people? Wow. Thank you. <laughs> the, uh, the, the, the idea as I as I watch that, and and part of it is the way we, we I understand the premise of this of this webinar. But I, I keep thinking, well, I would never let I would never fall for that. I wouldn't. I'm sure most of the people watching this are thinking, well, I would never give in to that kind of thing. I'd understand. I'd catch it. Is it? What what's your what's your response to the idea that? we we feel that we are not going to be subject to that well um i think we probably most of us on this webinar would know because of our knowledge of the criminal justice system um to say i want a lawyer and invoke our miranda rights so probably most of us wouldn't but almost everybody waives their Miranda rights and is naive and is brought up to believe the police are, are going to help them. Right. And right. wants to cooperate. So my response for most people, not people watching this webinar, although maybe some is that you just don't know what it's like to be in that situation. You don't know. Most people don't know. Police um, are trained in these methods of interrogation that they're sophisticated, high pressure methods that um, they don't know that uh, anything about the manuals, they don't know anything about the research, they haven't known people who went or were interrogated or falsely confessed. And it's also important to remember, you know, most of us um, are educated in ways that a lot of people aren't fortunate to have access to. And a lot of the people who end up in these cases didn't finish high school or college, and even if they did, don't understand the division of labor in the criminal justice system and almost think that the, the interrogator is trying to help them. The interrogator, you know, they treat interrogators sometimes like they're lawyers or their representatives, and that's part of the interrogation strategy to get the suspect to trust them. So I, I would say that um, if you have the knowledge and presence of mind to stop it. Probably you wouldn't falsely confess, but you've never been in a situation like that. You don't know what it's like. And I used to tell this joke, which I think captures it. Anybody who's married or has been married knows that at some point in a fight or an argument or a bad evening, you will just say anything or almost anything. <laughs> <laughs> put an end to it <laughs> and that's what happens in interrogation rooms at some point when people falsely confess and truthfully confess yeah is that <laughs> that's an interesting sort of a truism i i i <laughs> i i've read so many cases wherein people have just been beaten down to the point that they said you know I'll yes, I'll say anything you want me to say now, and ultimately it's going to be proven to be wrong, or say to themselves that sort of thing. But as you pointed out, once you get that confession, once they get that confession, it becomes a kind of uh, self-indicting process that is um, almost almost unimpeachable. That's correct. Yes, I mean, thankfully. You know, the, the innocence movement has exposed this. A lot of people are more educated. But many people have said, I just wanted to get out of the interrogation. I knew I was innocent. I would I would deal with it later. I could prove my innocence. Um, people who are aware of DNA thinking, we'll get a DNA test. That will prove my innocence. Uh, 
So I think psychologically beaten down is a good description of how most people feel after many hours of interrogation when they finally throw in the towel. And I think self-indicting in terms of the status of confession evidence too. Yeah. And and uh, as, as I, I think is true, one doesn't start out believing that the police would maliciously set out to frame innocent people. Um, that... Uh, and yet, from what you've just said, the investigators, the interrogators, are the ones who come in with the with the belief. Um, is that correct? The belief that the person is likely to be guilty. When they go into interrogation mode, if they're following their training, then yes, they're supposed to launch into the interrogation when they've concluded the person is guilty. It's not open-ended questions, although, as I mentioned earlier, there is rapport building to, to garner trust and sort of psychologically disarm or soften up the suspect. But the um, once, it, once they decide the person's guilty and they launch into accusatory interrogation, it's accusing the person of a serious crime. It's not, and using the techniques that I mentioned very quickly, not uh, you know, a friendly, open-ended questioning type session typically um you 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 said um uh, I, i'm looking at the fact that there's there's a kind of arrogance then involved on the part of the investigator the, the i i have the truth whatever you tell me is going to not going to overcome my knowledge and my ability to get you to confess to the truth um but the, the arrogance involved in that includes being willing to ignore exculpatory evidence, uh, being willing to override or uh, discard uh, any argument on the part of, the, of, of an innocent person. How do people live with that, do you think? Well, um, I want to go back to your prior question to answer this question. So I don't think it's malicious. I don't think there's the malicious intent to frame innocent people. There are some exceptional cases, of course, where that um, has happened. Um, but I think you're right. It is, I think police interrogators are made arrogant by their training in the Reed method and by other training firms when they are trained that they can be human lie detectors. And I think they're made arrogant when the goal is to aggressively, you know, within the limits of law, push the envelope as close as possible to, to aggressively rely on methods of pressure and persuasion, but not go over the line so that any confession gets thrown out by a court. But they're made arrogant by that guilt presumptive logic, by that belief that essentially they're godlike. They know the person's guilty. Now the goal is to get the confession. So when people say, well, okay, if it's not malice that leads to these, what is it? And I would say overzealousness, sometimes poor professional training, um, and sometimes arrogance, uh, and sometimes a reckless disregard for the truth, regardless of, of their intent. Now, again, I'm focusing on the false confession cases. Um, you know, there are many cases where they they do proper investigation and they get reliable or partially reliable confessions but you know there's an ends just you say how can they live with this it, it's there's very few police investigators just like polygraph examiners that, that, that they never admit they almost never admit their own errors the confirmation bias the tunnel vision mm -hmm. is so strong and our our adversary system is adversarial right people get locked into strong views and don't let go and frame everything in the light that confirms their priors once their priors are formed right okay since since 73 more than 195 people have been released from death row with evidence of their innocence according to the dpic the death penalty information center that means roughly four wrongly convicted death row prisoners have been exonerated each year since 1973. And DPIC reported that 69% of those exonerations involved 
official misconduct by police, prosecutors, or other government officials. Now, wouldn't one think then that in a death penalty case, investigators would be even more cautious, knowing that it would mean life or death for the perpetrator, for the presumed perpetrator? I would think so. Um, I'm I my my best um, based on studies I've read. I I I. I would think most of those, most of that official misconduct was the police or the prosecutors suppressing exculpatory evidence and thinking that no one would see it or misclassifying it in their mind as exculpatory. Um, uh, some of that might be uh, inflammatory statements that were made or improper statements that were made by prosecutors or even defense attorneys at trial or at a court. Um, so there, then there are other sources of misconduct, official misconduct as well. But you know, the death penalty cases and the non-death penalty exonerations, I, I think the National Registry of Exonerations, um, I think documents as well. There's, I think they've done a whole report on this. There's substantial official misconduct running throughout a high percentage of these exonerations, and. Because the stakes are so high in capital cases, um, that's where it's the most serious. Uh, mm -hmm. And unless we punish bad actors who suppress exculpatory evidence, we're going to continue to see the pattern. That's interesting. In, in terms of punishing the bad actors, Chicago, uh, one of the cases, one of the areas you've studied, uh, Chicago ranks number one, I believe in exonerations for the fifth year in a row, accounting to for more than half of the national total, according to the National Registry of Exonerations. What is it about a, a place like Chicago that creates a situation? Well, in, in my small part of this, the false confession cases, there's been a, a long history of um, uh, physical coercion and violence by Chicago police officers associated with um, the legendary John Burge, who was convicted for perjuring himself, but essentially a torture ring uh, by the Chicago Police Department. It's been um, acknowledged um, in governmental reports and studies and by Amnesty International and well documented that there is a systemic pattern and practice of police interrogation, coercion, abuse, and reckless disregard for the truth. And it really, it, it leading to hundreds of coerced and false confessions in homicide cases, mostly African-American men. Um, there's a problem with Chicago police culture. And I think there's a problem with the culture of the criminal justice system in Chicago. Uh, people aren't disciplined and uh, cops look the other way and it's very rough and tumble. I don't know. There might be other good reasons why, not just in the false confession cases, but in the other cases, Chicago has such a high number of wrongful convictions and exonerations. Um, very aggressive styles of lawyering that uh, hold no hostages. But it's also important to remember that while that number probably accurately reflects Chicago as being the place where most wrongful or more wrongful convictions than at any other place occur. We don't know how many wrongful convictions are out there. The National Registry has done a great service in documenting and identifying exonerations on their criteria of what counts as an exoneration. But, you know, we don't know if they got 30% of them, 90% of them, 2% of them. Right. So we only know what we discover. We don't know the full known universe of wrongful conviction cases. There may be places that have more that just have not been discovered. Yeah. yeah and and you mentioned uh, holding people accountable. Burge was dismissed, but he was never, uh, as far as I'm aware, never charged with anything, was he? Correct. So so he what he had done, there was very strong evidence of it, uh, is he had put alligator clips on people's ears and um, 
and and had a little black box and basically electro tortured them. He had suffocated people. They had beaten people. Uh, they had threatened to kill people. Um, and the statute of limitations for being prosecuted for that had run, but he was sued in civil suits as many other Chicago police officers affiliated with him and not have been uh, uh, um, in cases involving interrogations and coerced or false confessions. And in a deposition, in a civil suit, where you take an oath, it's equivalent to courtroom testimony, it might be entered into courtroom testimony. He lied about this. And so he, because the statute of limitations for physical assault and abuse had passed, he was prosecuted for perjury by lying in the civil depositions about the torture that he and others had inflicted mm. others under his command. And so, of course, in that case, the prosecutor had to demonstrate the torture to demonstrate that he had lied about it. And I, I believe he received a four-year sentence, went off to federal prison. Um, and so he did get convicted of that, but not directly of the acts of torture that led to not only false confessions, but a lot of people spending many years in prison, wrongful incarceration. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm glad to hear that. I watched that case for a long time. <clears throat> I wasn't aware that he was convicted. That's great. What 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 can be done, uh, Professor, to minimize the number of false confessions and subsequent wrongful convictions? Are there police departments open to changing in, in a way that they conduct in, interrogations, or is the system so entrenched there's little hope? Well, I think there are police departments that are open to change. One of the nice aspects of this area of study is that nobody really wants a false confession, right? So I say they happen because of overzealousness, um, incompetence, poor training, reckless disregard for the truth. That's really professional negligence. It's not that people set out, police set out to get false confessions. Um, there's a number of reforms I've written about for many years, as have others. The most important is recording the interrogation from start to finish. So there's a full record. We can see the coercion. We can see the contamination or not. Um, police departments were resistant to this initially, but it turns out they like it once they adopt it. Um, there are false allegations against police and they can document those. Um, or at least they, you know, they, 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 that's one of the reasons they say they're in favor of recording once they try it, it makes their job easier. Um, we could have better police training on the issue of interrogation and false confessions. Uh, in San Francisco, where I live and work, I think there's now maybe California requirement that police officers get bachelor's degrees, which um, changes the sensibility. I think if you put somebody through four years of college, they might get exposed to courses and have a different perspective on the fallibility of memory, the suggestibility of individuals, the problem of error, the many arguments against the death penalty, for example. Um, so, so, but what specific to interrogation really counter read programming. Um, you know, there, there is the rise of what's called investigative interviewing, which is a non guilt presumptive, non confession driven approach to just getting reliable or probative information um, to aid an investigation without accusing them right away or necessarily and doing more pre-interrogation investigation. It's really been pioneered in England and some of the Nordic countries, and it's starting to take hold here in the United States. People throw out other um, reforms, time limits on interrogations, no more than two hours, four hours, six hours. Um, uh, special populations, maybe having a guardian or a lawyer, juveniles in California, I think before they're interrogated, they have to talk to a public defender. Um, corroboration requirements for confessions. So you need stronger, you, you can't just have a confession, you need evidence that corroborates the details of the confession, changing the laws to have more strict corroboration requirements or making it easier for judges as a gatekeeper to exclude confessions if they are unreliable, as opposed to if they just violate Miranda or another procedural safeguard that's constitutional. 
Um, so those are some of the reforms that uh, I think could help. There's also civil suits uh, in Chicago. The city has paid out hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars in legal judgments um, for all kinds of cases, which is awful. It gives it gives compensation to the innocent individual who spent many years in prison and had their life ruined. It should be a deterrent in theory. It often is not, but maybe aligning um, the incentives so that there is punishment uh, or some kind of punishment for the interrogators or the department that allowed for that to happen, um, allowed for police to use coercive, improper, illegal techniques leading to false confessions, leading to wrongful convictions. Um, so that, that that's kind of the range of reforms that people talk about. Now, my general perspective is that the earlier the reform intervenes in the process, the better, right? Because these false confessions, like other wrongful sources of error in wrongful convictions, these cases just sort of snowball as they move from police to pretrial discovery, to prosecution, to trial. And so the earlier you can intervene to recognize it's a problematic confession and get it out of the stream of evidence, the more likely uh, one is to prevent a wrongful conviction. Um, in many cases, when people falsely confess, there is no prosecution. Some people, it's weird to say, are luckier than others in that sense. Um, so two reforms I didn't mention were jury instructions. People have suggested certain forms of jury instruction, and people have also suggested expert witness testimony, which I do a lot of actually. But those reforms, jury instructions and expert witness testimony occur at the back end of the process. At the trial, after the case has snowballed, people are dug in, the prosecution and police are dug in, all the eyewitnesses suddenly are saying it's 100%, right? The police are saying they did nothing wrong. And um, so the back end reforms I think are going to be less effective at preventing erroneous convictions than the front end reforms. The earlier the reform intervenes, the better. Mm -hmm. You, Richard, you've been involved in many notorious cases. Um, I, I will mention four or so, but one of them, I, I have a little story oh. about it. Um, there was a man in uh, in Virginia, and, uh, and in fact, he was the, the I believe the 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 uh, victim of a false confession. Um, but it was one that was self induced. He uh, woke up from a blackout, a drug or an alcohol induced blackout, and found um, two women with whom he was uh, rooming dead, and felt that he must have been the person who did it. So he turned himself in and confessed to the crime, even though the confessions he gave were inconsistent with the facts that the police um, knew to be the case. Now, that man was on death row for many years. He's now out of jail. But um, he had a lawyer who was ready to come down to, he was in Virginia, he had a lawyer who was ready to come down to work on his case. And he said, uh, instead of, spending your time with me, I want you to spend, uh, to look at the case of this man. And he pointed out Earl Washington. Um, Earl was a, is a case that you were involved with, along with the Central Park jogger defendants and um, Jesse Miskelly, uh, Jr. of West Memphis III. Um, what can you tell us about those cases? Were they similar, different? Was there a pattern? Was they were they unique? As was the case. Well, there were similarities and differences. Uh, Earl Washington um, has a low IQ, so he has intellectual disability. He's a very sweet man, um, and we don't have a record of his interrogation. But uh, looking at the confession, it was contradicted by substantial physical and other evidence. Uh, and he, he confessed to a lot, he confessed to basically anything the police wanted him to confess to, I believe other crimes as well, um, that they knew were implausible. And 
one of the things that's interesting about his case is that as DNA testing got better and better, he could he he could be he was eventually definitively excluded and pardoned. Um, this his case happened in the 1980s, as you know, and I was involved with Peter Newfeld of the Innocence Project, essentially trying to get him a civil judgment. So it was a civil trial, and and Peter Newfeld um, won a big award for Earl that 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 you know, with some measure, however inadequate of compensation for the time that he had spent wrongfully convicted. And I believe on death row. And I think he came within 11 days of execution at one point, if I'm remembering correctly, I may not be, but I think that's that, that, that was, um, there was a book written about his case called an expendable man by a journalist that was quite good. Um, so Earl Washington, um, uh, I think he was broken quickly, even though we don't have a record of the interrogation, an hour, two hours. I think he was a doormat, a people pleaser, a power puff, and he was walked on all over by the uh, investigating officers and like a sponge repeating back what they uh, wanted or what they wrote out. Jesse Miss Kelly of the West Memphis um, Four, or is West Memphis Three, I think. Jesse Miss Kelly also had intellectual disability, and so that's a similarity. But he was interrogated for about 11 hours, again, not recorded, made a lot of mistakes. Many, many years later, there was DNA that I think could dispositively show his innocence, but I think we know the heartbreaking story of the West Memphis Three that Jason Baldwin had said, look, I'm innocent, but I'm gonna take this plea bargain to get out of prison because of Damian Eccles, who was on death row and going crazy. And they all proclaimed their innocence. And I think they just wanted to get out of prison because as the DNA evidence started to resurface, surface, it, the prosecutions wanted to main, keep the conviction after, I don't know, 18 years in prison and get a, a, a plea to time served. Um, in Jesse Miss Kelly's case, like in Earl Washington's case, there the, it was clear that he was repeating back facts some accurate, some not, some plausible, some not, that were fed to him, that were incorporated in his confession. There was a lot of contamination and scripting. And in the Central Park Jogger case, we have one of the five individuals had intellectual disability, but all five of them um, were juveniles. They were between 14 and 16. And so they were vulnerable for that reason, but their interrogations, mostly unrecorded, were 14, 18, 24 hours, sometimes their parents were present, overnight, in, out. Um, they were very aggressive interrogations. Uh, I was involved in the civil suit. I interviewed some of them. I looked at interviews of other uh, others of them, uh, the plaintiffs, the Central Park Five, and they were yelled at, they were threatened, um, they were lied to, they were berated. Um, browbeaten, and sometimes their parents even um, got in on the act and, and you know encouraged them to quote unquote tell the truth. So in that case, you have more coercion, psychological coercion, even though you still have individual vulnerability, some coercion in Miss Kelly, but vulnerability and and mostly vulnerability in the case of Earl Washington and contamination and scripting and misclassification in all those cases. Mm -hmm. Uh, are you familiar with the name Marie Deans by any chance? I, I knew Marie not very well. Uh, yeah. Yeah. A wonderful woman. I think she got me involved in uh, Joseph Geritano's case, who you had mentioned, and and yeah. also uh, uh, Earl Washington's. She was really quite a quite a person. She was indeed. I, I, I her, her she comes to mind and often because she was one of the most most impressive people as far as I was concerned that got me involved in this work. Um, at her um, memorial service, a man came up to me and uh, actually he didn't come up to me. I came up to him because he was very, very shy. It was uh, Earl Washington. And I, I was uh, very, very moved to meet him and see the fact that he had paid enough attention and understood her importance and had shown up at the service. <laughs> 
are there uh, is there a particular case richard that 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 sticks in your mind that sticks out for you that um, for one reason or another um or are there so many that it's that it they all kind of fade into each other well there are a lot um and the older i get the harder it is to remember the details of all of them i am a professor but i also work on a lot of cases as a consultant now going back to the mid 90s over 2000 cases and i've testified in courtroom proceedings now over 400 times uh and so about 50 to 100 of these cases really stand out but the case that i know the best i wrote a book about it was on one of the slides the norfolk four case out of virginia where four navy sailors were coerced into confessing to a rape murder of uh, an, uh, uh, the wife, the 18-year-old wife of another sailor, and they were polygraphed, they were lied to about the polygraph results, they were interrogated for many hours, they were threatened with the death penalty, uh, they were also desperate, they would do anything to get out of the interrogation room 8, 10, 12, 14 hour interrogations. And no reasonable person could have thought those confessions were accurate if they just studied the crime scene. But yet the four individuals were prosecuted. Um, two of them took plea bargains to avoid the death penalty. That was back in the 90s when you know better than me, but I think Virginia was not only one of the most active uh numerically states imposing the death penalty but they were the shortest like six years from prosecution to execution so two of the factually innocent individuals in the norfolk four took plea bargains the other two went to trial one got convicted of a lesser crime the second got convicted of homicide and rape and got his conviction reversed went to trial again and got reconvicted and th there was dna evidence at the time of the trial that was excluded and in a show on um what was then called medical detectives but uh which was the precursor of forensic files one of the jurors was interviewed and asked why it is he convicted this individual derek tice and he said the confession was the supernova of the case and the confession was on its face absurd mm -hmm. um it, it was it was that seven white guys in Virginia who knew each other through the military were in a parking lot and an African-American man came into the parking lot who they didn't know and they wanted help from this African-American man who they didn't know to go kill this woman. So all eight of them went to her apartment with a claw hammer and beat the door down and then decided to gang rape and gang kill and, and kill her. And it was completely implausible, completely inconsistent with the factual evidence so much so that when this case became a cause celeb, um, there was something like 30 FBI agents who said these guys were all innocent, three or four former attorney generals of um, uh, Virginia who were all Republicans, uh, return attorney generals. So this case stand, stood out in my mind. There was a 2010 Frontline episode about it. Ofra Bikel, who who created that episode, did a great job, an hour and a half documentary. But that case stands out in my mind, not just because I wrote a book about it, but because there were so many multiple false confessions and there was so much systemic error and misconduct from police to prosecution to judge. It, 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 and it really stands out in my mind about systemic error. There is a tendency to look at these cases and think they're one offs. You know, this is such an outrageous case, but there are patterns. And this one had everything almost everything you know that you see in the wrongful conviction cases but there are many other cases that stand out as well i've been involved in cases where police officers were innocent provably innocent and they falsely confessed uh cases where people come to think they committed a crime they have no memory of and they confess right um yeah. so um maybe someday i'll write a memoir of these cases but there's so many of them I, I I understand. Uh, uh, Mary Kate, uh, do we have any questions from our audience? 
excuse me, Mike, we do, but um, well, um, if you are open, um, I did get a, a question. Um, there was one about Chicago, and I think um, uh, Dr. Leo answered that. The other um, is asking if there are more false confessions if the person is represented by a court-appointed attorney. Well, we, I mean, usually the representation would occur after the interrogation. So probably not more false confessions if someone is represented by a court attorney. The question might be, um, is that false confession more likely to result in a conviction of an innocent person if the person's represented by private counsel versus uh, public defenders? And it's, I, I don't know that there's a study of this, so it's kind of impressionistic and anecdotal. I think that um, public defenders are heroic. They don't make a lot of money. They have too many cases. They work many hours. Oftentimes they're just trying to mitigate the draconian sentences of the system. And oftentimes judges and prosecutors seem to be the team they're fighting, not just prosecutors. So I've seen a lot of great work from a lot of public defenders. I've also seen cases where private attorneys have not done very much work. They the the way they get paid is really kind of screwy, you know. Like you, you go to a, a a private attorney and they say, okay, you have to give me twenty five thousand or fifty thousand to the preliminary hearing. Then if you get charged, it's going to be another sixty thousand, whatever it is, right? And then you know, and then on top of that, if you go to trial, it creates an incentive oftentimes for private attorneys to do little work because they're collecting their money up front. They're not billing by the hour. Or, or getting paid according to um, their performance or any metrics, really. So I've, I've, I've seen a lot of private attorneys who have been lazy and the case goes to another private attorney or the public defender. And then I've seen some private attorneys who are just exceptional. And if, if one had the resources, and of course in capital cases, this is never the case or almost never the case, but if one had the resources, uh, one would hire a private attorney uh, a good private attorney only because they had a lower caseload than the defense attorney. But there's no studies showing that private attorneys, to my knowledge, versus public defenders, one group is better at preventing false confessions from leading to wrongful conviction. Okay, thank you. I just have one uh, one more quick question that's here that I think would be great. Um, can you cut off an interrogation the minute you ask for a lawyer, will that put an end? Is that like the best advice you could give to anyone who's arrested for a crime that they didn't commit? Just immediately get a, say, I need a lawyer? Yes. So there is a book called You Have the Right to Remain Innocent. And I love this book. Um, the subtitle of this book is What Every Police Officer Tells Their Children. So the, the book goes through all the reasons why you should never talk to the police in an interrogation, you know, um, uh, because the system is just stacked against you. For a lot of reasons, you could unintentionally incriminate yourself. Um, but anyway, the, the, this book also goes to the law and, and it, it shows as all criminal defense lawyers and criminal law professors know, m the Miranda warnings have been gutted down so much that if you say anything other than I want a lawyer, they can continue or they can come up with a reason to continue. So those are the magic words. Um, you know, I might say it respectfully, officer. Um, I, I would like to talk to a lawyer before I answer any other questions and um, happy to put you in touch with that lawyer, something like that. Right. But it has to be declarative because the, the law is so stacked against the defendant on Miranda that if you say, do you think I should have a lawyer? Maybe I'll get a lawyer. I don't know. I might want a lawyer. The courts have said, no, that's ambiguous. It doesn't count as an invocation. So yes. Um, now, look, if you're a witness or you're a victim, um, somebody breaks into your house, you know, or into the apartment next door, Obviously, you have to talk to the police in a lot of settings, but once you hear those Miranda warnings, their goal is to get a confession, and um, 
one should always in a high stakes situation like that, have the benefit of legal counsel in our constitutional system. So that would be the thing to say. And also, you know, there are a lot of good police officers. They have a hard job. They make mistakes. All professions make mistakes, including my own. I tend to focus on these horrific cases, just like death penalty focus focuses a lot on horrific cases in some places like Chicago and other places. It's systemic. It's cultural. There's all kinds of problems. And then there's places we don't hear as much about. Right. But still, uh, if you get read your Miranda warnings, the smartest thing to do is to say, I want a lawyer. And that's one of the warnings. You have the right to an attorney. If you can't afford one, one will be appointed. It doesn't mean that you have that right um, at trial. It means you have the right right now. And when they say anything you say can or will be used against you, people don't realize the jeopardy they're in. You know, mm -hmm. I, I've seen things like the police say, well, they were sitting in the runner's position, like their feet were facing the door, right? And that was consciousness of guilt or words are taken out of context um, and used are called confessions or incriminating statements. You, you know, you all know um, Kirk Bloodsworth, the great, famous Kirk Bloodsworth, and he never made a confession. I think they might have even put a gun on the table as an interrogation, but he spoke to the police, and some of those words were used against him, even though he said nothing incriminating. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, that those words may not have been the primary reason he was convicted. He had multiple erroneous eyewitnesses. Um, but anyway, so that is the answer, maybe a longer answer, but this book you have the right to remain innocent. What police officers teach their children. It's a thin book. It's an easy read. And of course, police officers teach their children. If you're interrogated, always ask for a lawyer and don't talk. Great. Marvelous irony. Thank you. Yeah, very ironic. Richard, you, you are a, a gem and a, a real value. Your work is extraordinary and the work you've done in the criminal justice system to correct the criminal justice system has been um, not only wonderful, but powerful and effective. And is we're very, very grateful for you, for your work and for your giving us this time. Well, thank you very much. It's an honor to be here. Um, I very much enjoyed this and I appreciate the great work that Death Penalty Focus has done and continues to do. Um, my colleague, uh, Laura Bazelon, I think is going to publish an article very soon about how we should be worried about the resurgence of the death penalty. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, just because the executions have gone down doesn't mean that there aren't currents out there that could bring this back to what it once was. So I, I'm deeply appreciative for the invitation and for all the great work that, that all of you do, including people whose faces I don't see who are in the audience. So thank you very much. Thank you. A great pleasure. Thanks. Likewise. All right. Take care. You. Bye.